There's three divisions to the church. We are part of the church militant. We're still struggling and fighting against sin, struggling to let the Lord in, to conquer sin, to conquer death. Then there's a church triumphant. All the saints in heaven surrounding the throne of the Lamb where the work of redemption has achieved its fullness, its perfection. What Christ wanted for these souls, he has wrought in saving them and bringing them into his Father's kingdom. Then there's the church suffering. Those who die in the friendship of God, but still need purification, and who are being purified in what tradition has called the, the fires of purgatory. You know, we don't like thinking about death, understandably. It's not like a pleasant cocktail subject, let's talk about. Unless, I guess, it's a club of morticians or something. In our culture, we really don't like it because we kind of put it away. We hide it. You know, in every ritual, in every culture, religion around the world, death is surrounded by all kinds of rituals. We've kind of reduced that. We have eliminated that, stripped it away. We've outsourced everything to a class of professionals. We want to get it done as swiftly, antiseptically, cleanly, and let's focus on the living, you know, celebration of life, the reality of death, which a dead body always reminds us of is something really don't want to pay attention to. Month of November, the church, always wanting to prod us out of our complacence, says, pray for the dead every day for this whole month. Subtext, you're going to be there. None of us gets out of this alive. Death comes to each and every one of us. And death, in a sense, is what our whole physical bodies are marked by. Once we're born, we kind of grow, reach our physical prime, and then it's a slow decline, right? <laughs> it's a slow decay, enfeeblement, loss of our faculties, of the energy and vigor of youth. And then a slide until one day each and every one of us will be brought face to face in front of that door, that valley that most of the time we spend kind of distracting ourselves from thinking about. The good news, of course, is, as the readings tell us, that death is not the end. It seems to be. Its darkness mocks us. Its darkness mocks every attempt at love and connection and immortality that our hearts desire. In Jesus Christ, we are promised that there is life. There is life. But there's nothing automatic about it. Sometimes it seems that when someone dies, the very fact of their death is the cause of their salvation. We don't say that as Catholics. When someone dies in the friendship of Christ and they have been completely purified and perfected, their will is completely in conformity to God's. They love God wholly and perfectly above all things. They are the perfection of virtues. They, drop, they die and will be admitted straight to heaven to see God face to face. And we recognize some of these as saints. We ask for them to pray for us in our ongoing battle. But for those who die in the friendship of God, and it is important to die in the friendship of God, and it is possible to lose that friendship in our life. While our wills are still wavering, while our hearts are still divided, while our loves are still small and fickle, it is possible for us to turn our back on God. And not just a remote abstract possibility just for axe murderers and Hitlers. Remember, the church still says that missing mass willfully on Sunday with no good cause is a grave sin. And a grave sin that is chosen with sufficient knowledge and freedom is what is known as a mortal sin that will end the friendship of God in our souls unless we reconcile. Those who die outside the friendship of God, there's hell. And you know what? A loving God requires that there be a hell. God doesn't send anyone there. We do. We choose it if we turn our backs on him. He respects the gift, the terrible gift that he has given us, the amazing, wonderful gift of freedom, without which love is not possible. If we're not free, we can't love. 
But that, the other side of that is the possibility of losing that love forever. For those who die in the friendship of God but still need to be purified, which I suspect will be most of us, I don't know. We're called to be saints. We're called to aim high. Don't aim low. You might miss the mark. But we, at the end of our life, if we're in the friendship of, of God, there is a period of purification, purgation, of our selfishness being stripped away, and the scriptures describe it, and the tradition describes it, as a time of pain and suffering. What we do know is that the prayers of the living, in some mysterious way, help the prayers of those in the church suffering in purgatory, which is why we have masses offered for the dead, which is why we say the prayers for the dead, which is why we have this whole month that is given to praying, especially for those whom no one is praying for, those who die in ways that we don't even hear about, the poor, the oppressed, the victims of violence and war. This month, the church says, pray for them, offer penance, and sacrifice and mortification for them. We should live a life of penance. That is, especially on Fridays, you know, Fridays it used to be very clear, don't eat meat, otherwise you're Baptist or something, I'm not sure what. But we are still called to do penance. If we're not gonna eat meat, then we should give up something. This month of November, let us return to that Friday practice of giving something up, something good, some small sacrifice. It doesn't have to be visible. In fact, it's better if it's not something between you and God that you give up in order to prepare yourself for the judgment, in order to help our brothers and sisters who are suffering in the afterlife. We will rise again in the resurrection of the dead with our mortal bodies transformed into immortal glory. But it is not automatic. It is not simply that it happens by following some kind of external religious ritual. Put your check in the basket and that's it. It requires an emptying of self, a surrender to the love of God. And God in his mercy gives us this time on earth to prepare ourselves to woo us with his love so that he can come into us and transform us from within into a creature of immense and amazing glory. During this month of, of November, as we commemorate all the faithful departed, as the church asks us, let us pray for the dead. Let us pray for the poor souls. Let us take on works of penance. And let us, most of all, every day ask for the grace to continue in our struggle in this life to live as Christ would have us live, to love God above all things, to love our neighbor as ourself.